Welcome to another episode of the Traveling Hoopers podcast. Today, I have my good friends, Philip Dixon and Calvin, right in front of me. Guys, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Um, once again, of course, I'm Calvin McGowan. A pleasure to be here as always. And I guess we do have a fair bit to talk about, don't we? Yes. Yes, we do. Uh, yeah. And uh, my name is Philip Dixon, a.k.a. Oof. Cell phone broke. Um, and, you know, I guess we got a lot to talk about today, don't we? All right. And I am your host, Alan Pettigrew. Let's go ahead and get into this. We took last week off, which means we did not have our full coverage for the last game of the NBA Finals. But if you watched our Instagram live halftime shows, you know exactly how everything played out. You can follow us on our YouTube and Instagram pages to get those all together. But since then, we've crowned the Bucks champion. Giannis has the finals MVP. We talk about legacy for no apparent reason after people's first championships. Then we had the NBA draft this Friday. We had Kay Cunningham going first, Jalen Green going second, and <clears throat> my guy Evan Mobley going third. And now today is the first day of free agency, and we've already seen Kawhi decline his, decline his player option. We saw some really big trades go down. And let's go ahead and get into all of the fun stuff. What do you guys want to talk about first? <laughs> Doesn't make it just put on us. Uh, I say we just talk about, you know, some of the trades that happened so far. Um, um, starting off with the big one being... Um, Brody, Russell Westbrook, yeah. uh, so Los Angeles Lakers. Personally, um, great regular season team. Probably won't be, will do fine in the playoffs. Um, and I just say fine because you never know the durability of Anthony Davis. Like, you truly just never know. Um, also, Russell Westbrook still can't shoot a three. So, there's that. Uh, a couple of years ago, Russell Westbrook was playing in the playoffs through injury, and you can just tell because he wasn't playing like him normal, his normal self. Um, but you know, a player like him would never like come out and say he's playing through injury. He'll kind of just go out there and do it. Um, so we've kind of just seen like, a, yes, he's averaging triple doubles, but kind of like a where are you at? Like it depends on where the season it is. Are they empty stats? So they like stats are being meaningful. So <clears throat> so a bunch of different things are happening, right? Um, with what's Russell with the last couple seasons. Um, so I'm curious to see how it's going to be this year, uh, especially with the ball, how ball dominant Russell Westbrook is, with a ball dominant LeBron on the team too. So I'm I'm curious to see if LeBron's going to be able to mentally play off the ball. Um, I, I, I assume he will because he's a, he's a smart player. But every single time we've had a chance to see LeBron play off the ball, he just hasn't done it. Like, you're like, oh, yeah, this is the year LeBron's going to play off the ball. This is the year LeBron's going to play the ball. And all of a sudden the season happens, you're just like, oh, this is another season of LeBron holding on to the ball again. Um, so I'm curious to see, like, but, like, also those – point guards or ball dominant people he hasn't had he's had haven't been as I guess the or alpha or as I don't want to say alpha or as like impassioned about playing on the ball as Russell Westbrook is, right? Uh personality wise, he's just a very dominant personality. So I'm curious to see how this gonna mix. But once again, I'm thinking they're gonna make it to they're gonna make it to the second round. But I Argue, depending on how the moves, the rest of these moves go for the free agency and some trades, I'd argue that they won't get past that. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. They have to sign a like a decent amount of shooters because I have no idea what this is going to look like. Like LeBron has got to the point where he's almost a forty percent shooter from three, but those shots look completely different. And I imagine there's going to have to be like a volume change with it too, especially with Russell Westbrook on the floor. Because there is not much of an off-ball position you can have Russell Westbrook. Like, sure, he has the IQ to be, like, a good cutter. But I, for you to really get, like, the bang for your buck for Westbrook, he kind of has to be ball-dominant. 
like I can't think of a situation where he's useful in off ball. And I know that sounds like much worse, but like there's still a dude that can average ten assists a game. And like we were saying earlier, uh, LeBron basically cast it like rechange his game again, like for this to be like a thing that actually works. I know we talked about this like a while back, mm-hmm. but like this is this is like wing LeBron or like slightly move him to the floor for to see what that works. Like I, I I'm just not sure what it is, but it is like a nice group of talent. Here's my question. I just this up. So even now, right, being like last season and at the moment, Russell Res- Russell Westbrook's game is dictated around his explosiveness and athleticism. When he's been injured or when he's looked injured, it might you know it might not be said to the world, but even when he looked injured, you saw his game change drastically in a negative way. Right, uh, he was taking shots, mission shots, going to the rim instead of dunking on people and finessing around them. He's getting blocked on a regular basis, right? Like we, we've seen examples of this. He's 32 years old. Is his game just not gonna change to where or change to the effectiveness of it is efficient without having to rely on? explosion athleticism whatever and just pure skill because if that's the case 36 35 not 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 even because we've seen it starting to break down right not everybody has lebron it can be like the way lebron is at 36 right 36 37 38 two years and he's two years and he's like normal like a normal person no more triple doubles. Just a normal guy who works hard is what he will look like. Is what he will look like in the court. But I have yet to see his game even kind of shift even a little bit to where you can see the way he plays evolving and being efficient in the future. Um, so when do we stop thinking about Russell Westbrook? has like a youthful explosion player when eventually he's going to get old and that's just going to be dead real quick. Well, um, because, like, I feel like part of it, though, is, of course, that, like, Russ has always kind of been the kind of player, I guess, probably because he wants to win, he tries to do everything, right? And, like, part of his whole thing is that, like, he got really good regardless of whether or not you think he puts up empty stats or whatever, he got really good at being able to, like, do everything, which they score, rebound, pass. And, like, he's tended to be in a lot of situations where they still ask that of him or don't ask. (laughs) Don't ask that of him, which... I completely agree. He has been in certain situations to where they ask him to do a lot, right? Score, rebound, assist, whatever. My issue is the way he scores is purely based off athleticism, and we've only seen, and that hasn't translated. There's there's been very few examples of people that that's been their game and it goes into deep or mid to deep 30s of, like, being somewhat efficient. You know what I mean? Um, Russell Rusbrook's even his pull-up mid-range isn't even that good no more. It's, it's fine, but it used to be better. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's something to do with, like, the lift on a shot, whatever it is. It used to be better. Three-point shot still atrocious, right? Um, but even when it comes to, like, his rebounds, uh, he's like a you know, notoriously great rebounder as a point guard. It's not even based off of positioning that much of what I've seen. It's more of him just working harder than the next person to get the rebound. And eventually, unless you're built like LeBron, that drop-off is going to come quick because you're normal. 
you're 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 a, not normal in terms of like the average person, but in terms of an NBA caliber athlete, you're a normal person who isn't able to hold up that standard of you know athleticism and explosiveness and whatever um, that only a tiny percent of elite athletes have been able to do. So I get that like he's been asked. He, he being Russell Westbrook has been put in positions to where that has to be the case. But would you rather him not be put in positions and just do all skill stuff? Because we've seen his skill and it's not there. Well, it's like, no, it's like, here's like my thinking is more so that like the thing is that, and granted, it is also kind of playing, but it's like the thing is when he goes to play with the Lakers and LeBron and AD, like he's probably going to have to do play a role that like he hasn't been asked to play before right and and like we we established he's not that great of a three-point shooter like he's probably mostly going to be like a slasher and probably asked to take scoring load off of lebron right Mm -hmm. but like when crunch time rolls around it's the ball is not going to be in his hands like we know this and like we can like unless lebron is hurt Wait, will it not though? Because you don't want him off the ball. You want him driving and kicking the ball. The so I'd rather, I'd, I'd rather the ball be in his hands at the end of the game because otherwise, if the ball's not in his hands, he's sitting there in the corner. And you're like, oh, we can double off this man just so, you know, we can have him over the jump shot. We're good with that. But you can't have LeBron over there by himself. Or Anthony Davis with it by himself. So I'd rather him have the ball in his hands at the end of the game. But the issue is, it, my mindset is, this is the Lakers, right? Is this a short-term investment? Yes. Very. Uh, I think it's. I think it's a year-long investment. If they don't go, if they don't win a championship this year, someone's gone. Yeah. Like, and I don't, it won't be AD and LeBron because they, they they just won. So you mean to tell me we just, we just go pass Russ around like uh, Russ like at the end of his career? I don't appreciate that because all these one-year like, stops making me feel weird. I, no, I am a Russell Westbrook fan. Like, I don't want it to come off as I'm not. But the way his game is, he, at the end of his career, and we saw it this past year with the Wizards, has a strong capability to be Chauncey Billups like and just journeyman. Just journeyman of a team that needs whatever. And then once this athleticism aspect of his game goes away, then that's when you over here being two teams a year. You know what I mean? And it's unfortunate, but I have not yet seen the evidence that his athleticism, when it goes down, his skill level will go up. Because even with LeBron, right, the ultimate athlete we've seen in our eyes, right, we don't remember Jordan all kind of stuff, but we've seen him, right, when his athleticism went down, his skill level, you saw it, like, meet in the middle, and now you're starting to see it, like, transcend the other, the other direction, right? Vince Carter, same thing, right? Athleticism, athleticism went down, but Vince Carter turned himself into one heck of a three-point shooter and mm-hmm. whatever, right? You saw the skill, footwork, whatever. Russell Westbrook, we've seen athleticism come down, but we've never seen a skill come up, so it's gonna it's, it's gonna end up being this unless he proves us otherwise. And you know who this part of his career reminds me of? Allen Iverson. I remember like towards the end of his career, he was what Detroit. Um, I know he was at Memphis for a while, where he was like, like three days, like he could score, but you didn't really want him. You didn't want the ball in his hands like that just because he wasn't the same guy. And I feel like that's going to be the same thing for Russell Westbrook as he ages. But I feel like he got enough in the tank for about it, for another year of Russell Westbrook type production. I just don't know what that looks like with, uh, that's a, with LA. That's a, that's a accurate comparison, right? The, 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 the AI comparison. But AI could be, I could be, I could shoot. Like, if anything, yeah, I could shoot. But he like, needed to shoot a lot. I know. For you to actually get some production out of it. But he could shoot, though. Like, just you just being able to shoot 
the averages of every spot on the floor does something. Russell Westbrook, in terms of shooting, is below average in almost everything, except free throws, maybe. In terms of shooting, right? We're not counting layups and that kind of stuff. Now, if you want to... I'm looking up the stats for both of them, and you know, your boy Iverson was a career 31% shooter. From what? And... Guess who else is a career 31% shooter from three? I'm going to guess the other person talking about this very moment. Yes, Russell Westbrook. And but, but, but but context, they shot a lot less threes back than they do now. So we're talking about efficiency. Yeah. Like, but, I get what you but, but, but if you're going to shoot a lot more threes, yeah, it's going to momentum swings and all kind of stuff. It adds into a whole different aspect. You're going to shoot more of those threes. Okay, so yeah. what you're saying is Russ no. needs to become a trucker from deep. And we've seen that happen before. No, he doesn't. Trust me. No, I'm I don't I'm just saying he just needs to hit that mid-range jump shot very, very, very consistently. The U three, don't take it. Just step just take a step in and shoot that thing. Because his I don't know, like his whole game is based off of athleticism. Because he's been a superior athlete his whole entire career. And so I'm just like, if it get but to the Lakers' credit, well, not, not, not really to their credit, more, more to the credit of LeBron, if anybody could work with a player like that, I mean, it's LeBron James, yeah. right? Like, LeBron James has established himself to, like, be at least aware enough of his own game or aware enough of his teammates' games to be able to adjust somewhat depending on who it is um and i'm hoping that's going to be the case this one too yeah man <clears throat> but uh let's go ahead and move on i feel like we've beaten a, a dead horse this is another team that I, I really can't wait to track throughout the season let's go ahead and touch on what we've seen from free agency we're only like an hour and 15 minutes into all of this so uh biggest note that I've seen so far that I want to talk about is the Suns giving CP3 $120 million for four years after what we just saw in the finals where he looked good those last four games. He, mm. like, of course, he rebounded towards game five and game six, but there was a super slide in game three and game four. Well, realistically, game two through four where Chris Paul did not look very Chris Paul. And then even in those final two games, he had the numbers to look like Chris Paul, but he didn't have those game-changing moments where we're used to being like, that's the point guy. Like, of course, he came up, made plays, scored, hit those uh, mid-range jump shots. But there were moments where it was just, where is Chris Paul? So... They got four more years of that. I just, I really want to well, see how they manage that and who but, steps up. But, like, the thing is, I think some of it's like you're not just paying him for, like, the finals performance. You're paying him because of what he did, what he does as, like, a leader on your team, as well as just, like, the production he brings through the rest of the season. Right? It's kind of like, you the kind of paying him to be the dude in charge. Even if, like, even if you... Make the argument like he's not the best player, like the young players are going to get better and surpass him or maybe already have, right? You, He also brings a level of, like, control and leadership that that, especially coupled with his skill level, like, is kind of hard to replace. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. and, it's, and it's like, it's also a thing where it's like, yeah, he didn't, like, he had a bad stretch in the finals, but it's also like, if he's... If they had had somebody who's not Chris Paul, they're not there anyway. Yeah. I mean, I understand that, too. Um, it's this past year, if you don't have Chris Paul, you don't get to the finals. If you don't believe that, you're ridiculous. <laughs> but also, that's not the issue. The issue is the third and fourth years of this contract. Um, and, you know, hurt this year. You can make an argument. He was more than likely hurt. Um, those last couple of games really kind of hit him probably in the playoffs, right? You saw him play. He's not really playing himself. So we don't know if he was hurt. But 
literally just because Chris Paul, you can give him the benefit of the doubt, right? Literally, just because, you know, you've seen the production he gives. But also, Chris Paul's always hurt at the end of the season like this. Um, and it's not his fault. It's just, and I've said it once, I'll say it again. He has the heart of LeBron, but the body of Alan Pettigrew. You know what I mean? Like I appreciate he, that, yeah. He, right? He has the body of like a normal person. But he has the heart of somebody who is much bigger and faster and stronger than he is. Um, so this might work out in two in a year, two years, whatever. But then, and, and honestly, it might work out. You, we don't even know if they'll get to the championship because th- if Kawhi isn't injured this year, they don't make it to the championship. I downright believe that. If Kawhi doesn't get hurt... If it's not just an AC, if it's not an ACL tear, whatever, they don't make it to the championship. So going forward, even the next two years, the first two years of the contract are like, all right, let's see what happens, right? You're, you're, you might be in a discussion, whatever. But the goal is let's keep him healthy. Those back two years, what? Because what? That, that that means he'd be getting paid to forty, right? He's thirty six. That's the value. Right? So he'd be getting paid to about forty. Like, whoa, <laughs> you know what I mean? For a guy who's injury prone and has been injury prone towards the end of the season since he was in his late 20s, um, to go into age 40, do you expect anything different? Like, yeah, you could probably back that, that back in the back end, you could probably, and they're probably think, banking on this to restructure a contract and you know, things like that, whatever. But, um, I don't know how how much you can restructure that. I don't know how smart that is. Whatever. Uh, but four years to a man who just got injured in the finals, who's 36, is uh, ambitious. Congrats, Chris Paul. You got your coin. Like, like congratulations to him, right? Like, 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 congrats to Chris Paul. He did what he needed to do. He got that goo-wop. But for the Phoenix Suns, I'm like, oh, okay. You could have gotten a little cheaper or something like that. You know what I mean? Because he obviously wanted to stay. So. Look, I appreciate the loyalty that they're showing with this move. And I also appreciate that Chris Paul got $20 million more than he was asking. They probably could have gave him four one hundred. dollars Like, I would like to see a deeper story on why they gave him a, what, $5 million a year tip? Uh, yeah, but I mean, he's he just going to give it back in the HBCUs, I hope. That's me putting that pressure on him, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It, this is besides the point. Fam, you pay, like, everybody's 2020 balance. I'm going to need them to go ahead and hit me up with that, too. So <laughs> stop playing with me, yo. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's funny. No, I dig it, though. But, but yeah, this this whole thing is, it is interesting. I will say this. This is probably the most interesting contract that has been established so far. Um, and there's some other ones we should, we should, we should talk about. But this right here is a very interesting one, uh, Chris Paul, literally because of his age um, and injuries, right? Like, that's, that's, those, those two things make it, like, it's either a good thing or a bad thing. But, yeah, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll just see. We'll just see. All right. But uh, sticking to the point guard position, another hey. day one trade that is looking super nice. If I may, real quick, nice. before we, we dip off on this one. Something I just thought about is like oh, my something. Another reason why you might do the hmm. I'll miss it with you. Go with Calvin. Keep going, Calvin. Is uh, Edgar. Like, what if like part of that contract is the plan to basically in the next draft or two, just you draft a dude to replace Paul basically, like for when he for when the contract is up. Granted, you can make the argument it's still not really worth the money, but what do, what, do you, what do you mean you draft a dude to replace? Basically, like you get a you you draft a point guard, uh-huh. and Chris Paul's entire job is to prepare him for when Chris Paul retires, almost certainly at the end of this contract. Okay, because in my in my head I was thinking, which I was wrong, but in my head I was thinking you meant like they are bad and they oh. get like a Mikey, you know what I mean? Like they over here getting getting old dude. And I'm like, oh no no, you mean like they'll get like a Regular point guard, and Chris Paul's job is to like big him up to be like this is when you, this is where Devin Booker likes the ball. Yeah, and just otherwise like how to be a 
talent, like how to be a good point guard. I mean, he he uh, he honestly could do that with Cameron Payne too, though. Like Cameron Payne, I think right now I'm thinking of Cameron Payne, Allen, Calvin. Like if I'm all in one, tell me. At this past season, I'm thinking of Cameron Payne. How do you remember when Reggie Jackson had that one season with Oklahoma City? Yeah. And all of a sudden, mm-hmm. next after that, people like were like, he went to Detroit and he got paid t- stupid money because he bamboozled people into thinking he was a starting point guard. And then he just wasn't good for a long time. And then all of a sudden, this past year with the Clippers, especially towards the back end of the season to the play and in the playoffs, he just like reached that Oklahoma City level again for whatever reason. Like, I wonder if Cameron Payne, like, bamboozled us into thinking he's a really good point guard purely based on the systems he's in. He's a good backup. But I, I thought the same thing about Reggie. And Reggie was a good backup, but he bamboozled people think he was a great point guard. And when Cameron Payne, when Chris Paul went out and Cameron Payne stepped in, he he went off. But did he go off because he's a really good starting point guard or a good starting point guard? Or did he go off because um you know, people weren't prepared for him, they were more prepared for Chris Paul. Or, or you know, uh, did he go off because, you know, it was just one playoff series or one a couple playoff games in one playoff series. We don't know. But when he stepped in, he did his thing. So I wouldn't be surprised if Cameron Payne got paid decent money somewhere uh, to be like, you know, the Orlando Magic starting point guard or something like that. You know what I mean? Look. If Orlando was dumb enough to give that man the bag after having, like, two solid point guards in the ranks, crazy. But, Calvin, I 100% agree and like your thinking on this, except the part where whoever that next point guard is not going to be Chris Paul. And I imagine they're going to be, like, decent in the playoffs over these next few years where you're probably drafting somebody in, like, the 20s. And I don't know if that is going to be where your future point guard is. I know that's saying a lot because that means I'm talking crap on, like, the dudes that are graduating in, like, the class of 2024. But um, I I just don't know what that looks like. But I do really like the idea. Why are you looking at me like that? I really do like the idea of... um. Chris Paul basically like mentoring, not babysitting, but doing like what uh, like the NFL does, where they get like you know you have your top it's tier a, quarterback for like another it's two years. It's a mentorship. It's a mentorship. Yeah. Exactly. Like I, I I appreciate the idea, of it. I just well real quick. I don't want to mentoring the whole team. I just give you that look uh, because Doug McDermott got forty two million just now for uh, to go to the Spurs. And I was like, well, mm-hmm. they give away money, huh? Like, dude, like, this makes you wish I would have worked a little bit harder. You know what <laughs> I mean? <laughs> like, that's uh, Doug McDermott. Yeah, like, he was a good college, a great college player. But even he got 42 mil. Come on, man. But whatever. That's what happened when you 6'8 and you can shoot. I thought, I forgot he was in the league. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of you. I forgot he was in the league till just now. Because he's in what? Indiana, right? Indiana. Yeah. Indiana. Who else played for? Bulls. Played for. He's been a tournament. Game I'm going to win. Been a <laughs> hey, but no, in the day, he's going to be like, I'm a great legend, though. Uh, top 10 in scoring, all kind of stuff, in the nation's history, all kind of stuff. So it's just thing. But and my daddy's still the coach. So when I retire from here, I got a coaching opportunity, baby. Facts. Facts. But you're about to talk about a different point guard, though? Yes. Oh, five minutes ago, by the way. But <laughs> let's go ahead and stop. step into the Lonzo Ball news. He is now officially a bull after sending, what, Thomas Sadoransky, Garrett Temple, in a second-round pick in exchange for him to New Orleans. Like, what do you guys think about this? Because I like the move i just don't know what it means for like the bulls as an organization i don't know if this is like one of those moves where you move into like the top eight Uh, i feel like they're still kind of bottom tier i think this i think this 
So the it was either the Bulls or the Clippers who were going for him, right? Yeah. And then today we started hearing about some like signing trades to give him to Charlotte. But that was all hogwash. That was all hogwash. There was no way that there was no way that was going to be a thing because the only way the only reason that became a thing is because Leangelo was on the summer league team for Charlotte. It, yeah. That was never going to happen. That's that was a ridiculous rhetoric that was probably started by uh Ed, yeah, Twitter. You know, Twitter or something like that. You know what I mean? Like somebody with an anime Abby, but. The bull. I'm, I'm thinking when it comes to the Bulls, is this: the Bulls just made themselves very fast. Like offensively, they're going to be very fast, and they didn't lose anything defensively, right? So, but with Lonzo, you have a pass first point guard who was a very improved shooter. So with that being the case, you can put him on the ball. With Zach Levine as the entity to like move around and get open, because uh, he's going to be a willing passer, or you can have the ball with Zach Levine and lose nothing in terms of shooting with him on the court at the same time. Yeah. Um, but with a willing passer like that, and you know they, they are, they're obviously all in on Zach, Zach Levine because last two years he's been going stupid, right? But with that being the case, you bring Lonzo Ball in, pass first point guard who's a shooter, that's more op- or. With that being the case, you have a better chance of bringing other players into that situation because people like Zach Levine. Like there is, there is that's known, right? It's a common rhetoric. People like Zach Levine, but people also like a point guard who's going to pass in the ball, like superstars, stars, right? And it also helps that Chicago is a legit destination city, like in America, like you know. People are going to want to go there. So I think they're trying to set up a culture, a young, fast team that, that can really get there and go. But also, like, they want more ball movement because it was too Zach, it was too Zach Levine ball dominant last year. So you bring Lonzo Ball in, immediately, if everything goes bad, you at least know there's going to be much better ball movement. So... They're betting on the future with this move. They're betting on, I wouldn't say the future. I wouldn't say the future. Because if, if, if you are indicating the future being like a year or two, sure. But like this year does big things going into that, right? Because last year, uh, I'm having a brain fart. A uh, guy from uh, the Magic, they brought in. They traded it to get. Big man. Oh, oh who traded? Yeah. So they got him. But there was, like, no really, like, practice time to get him, impl- in, like, implemented it to, like, uh, the system of the Bulls and playing with Zach Levine and stuff. But when you have Lonzo Ball, we've already seen how Lonzo Ball thrives with the very good big man. Automatically, right? It doesn't have to be athleticism, but just, like, getting the big man where he wants the ball on time in the spaces he wants the ball. They brought Lonzo Ball in also to make him happy because he is an all-star. They brought Lonzo Ball in to make him happy, but also, once again, efficient, good ball movement around because Zach Levine last year was too – before they make that trade um, with the Orlando Magic, Zach Levine had the ball all the time, and it was the Zach Levine show. They brought this other guy in. Zach Levine is not a a a pass first player. So he was already accustomed to playing the way he had been playing. The guy into the All Star team. All of a sudden, uh, you know, he has to make that adjustment in the mid in the middle of a season. And unless you're a certain kind of player, you're not going to make that adjustment easily. You know what I mean? Because you've made it this far. And when Zach, remember when Zach Levine first came into the NBA, I remember them saying he was going to be like a backup point guard. He was going to go to the G League for a long time. Like people did not have confidence that Zach Levine would be here would be where he is right now. But we also know Zach Levine has supreme confidence, and that's why he is at the level he is right now in terms of scoring and you know his whole entire game overall. So, of course, he wouldn't quickly adjust to giving the ball to a big man running around, whatever it is, right? But bringing Alonzo Ball in automatically bridges that gap. So that that is what they're doing present. But once again, it's going to be easier to bring people in the future because they want that it's going to allow, you know, uh, um, people to get the touches they want to make them happy. All right. 
I feel like you just explained to me what is it going to make this team like fruitful. Like with the with the game being faster and Vucevic being their all star, Vucevic not very fast. Like I I almost feel like the they're going to either have to they're going to have to find some type of perfect tempo to really get all of them to really be working at full speed, right? I mean, you're the find some kind of perfect tempo, of course. But if you watch Lonzo Ball's career so far, he can play in multiple tempos, right? Half court. You know, you, you couldn't say this when he first came into the league, but you can say it now, right? Transition, elite. Half court, very, very good because he can now shoot the ball. And so... And he's a willing passer, so the cuts, all that kind of stuff. So it just translates well with Zach Levine's game, but it also translates well with with everybody's game on the team, right? But they also are very young. Like, they're very, very young. Kobe White is just going to benefit from this. Because there's a couple of games last year where Kobe White went off in terms of three-point shooting. So to have another shooter out there who can also, like, do things with the ball, it's going to just let him be able to be more free and do what he needs to do, right? Get more comfortable in the NBA game. And Kobe White's already nice, so he's going to you – know, he's already been nice, and everybody who watched him in college saw that. But bringing Lonzo Ball in is going to benefit the whole team because we saw that with every other team, right? Like, Kyle Kuzma is, is cheeks without Lonzo Ball the first two seasons. Like, like, no, like no joke, he is atrocious without Lonzo Ball – those first two seasons, right? Because he was giving him the ball where he wanted every single time, so he was able to hit those shots. And then, you know, in New Orleans, you know, having a highlight reels with, with Zion Williamson, right? But Zion Williamson's going to still get his thing, but watch how low-key, more difficult it might be for him to get those points now because he doesn't have a point guard who can give it to him whenever he wants, right there, whatever, right? So just Lonzo Ball just being in that situation in Chicago is going to just, like... The ball movement is going to be very fluid, and one of the biggest issues last year was that the ball movement really stuck with Zach Levine. Yeah, and they're going to have a really big uh, backcourt too. What Kobe White is six five, uh, Zach Levine is six five. Then you got your new starting point guard Lonzo Ball who's six six. Like they they're going to have some size back there. It's going to be fun. Yeah, I want to put this out there also. I did not look at, I did not watch any analysts about this. This is all from me, bro. I'm telling you, bro. Like, just clip, clip this snippet out and tell people to follow me on Twitter if they want to know what the real deal is. Like, you're not going to tweet. Huh? You're not going to tweet, so it don't matter. Yeah, you're right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tweet about the Kanye. Yeah, I'm coming off right now. I thought that already came out, but that's besides the point. No, nah, you know, he didn't listen to it. Then he dropped it, he dropped it this Friday. All right. Chicago. Um, it's, it's, all, it's all related. Oh, okay. that was crazy. You did. Shout out to you. Speaking of uh, another young point guard who was getting the bag, the Hawks just gave Trey Young a 170 million dollar extension for the next five years, and it could go up to 201 million dollars, which is nice. And he he deserved all of that after what we just saw in the playoffs. Like yeah. this man is what. In less games than everybody else who's on that list, he's, what, number four in first year scoring in the playoffs, which is, like, wild considering he didn't shoot the three as well as he's used to, at least in the regular season. So, I mean, bright future over there, yeah. My word told me, like, Trey Young's going to get this contract. Do you think he deserves it? I'll go with the sky blue. No, he deserves it. Like, <laughs> do you see this, this last season they had in the playoffs? Like, come on now. Hey. You know who having a really good uh, free agency so far? Uh, hold on. In terms of teams? Yeah. You're talking about the – it's going to be – you're either going to say the Heat or the Nuggets, one of the two. Oh, no. Definitely the Nuggets, bro. So, uh -huh. they bring back Will Barton. They bring back Jermichael Green. And they just signed Jeff Green. Okay. So – I don't know if you remember too much about the playoffs. At some point when the Nuggets were getting slapped up, the only people who were making plays consistently was Will Barton. And then the year we just saw from Jeff Green when he was playing with the Nets where he was coming up big, you still got him, and it's almost even a lesser role 
where he doesn't have to be there as much as he was with the Nets because you got guys like Jermichael Green. Like, I I really appreciate what the Nuggets are doing over there. Like, they drafted well. They make good signings. And, like, it's a tight-knit group. It's not like a lot of come and go, at least over, like, the past three years. Like, I don't know, bro. I mean, they're making moves to where they're just going to prove, I think it's all of us on this podcast, uh, right, uh, towards the end of their playoff run. Yeah. They the regular season. Um, just with Murray coming back and Michael Porter Jr. doing what he did this past season while Murray was out, they're going to be very... Like, like, they're one of the reasons you can't say the Lakers going to win the championship. They're one of the reasons you can't say the Lakers going to make it out the second round. Like, they're going to be that good. Because, one, they're built for the regular season. But now, with Murray coming back, you know he built for the playoffs. And you know Murray vicious, like, on the court. You know he's sick that he missed his last season. So, he just going to be a playoff star. He can go in. Michael Porter Jr. got the confidence of a Greek god. Like, why this man so confident? I don't understand why. Like, because he is a Greek god. That man is 6'10, shoots threes, and is one of the most athletic players at his position. I, I don't know if I ever, I don't know, I don't know if I'll ever call another man a Greek god, but it is what it is. You uh, just did. No, I said he had the confidence of a Greek god. You called him a Greek god himself and like, talked about him physically. Slide. Uh, but, but he, like, min, 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 mentally, right? Mentally, he is up there with, like, the most confident people in the league. And it's very obvious, right? And then Jokic is Charmin, right? The softest touch in the league. Everything he touched, the, whenever the ball touched the rim, you're like, oh, it's going to go in, right? It goes through, it goes nothing but uh, rim or nothing but net, goes to the rim, and you barely see the net move. I'm like, okay, like, the guy's just nice, right? Crazy footwork, great passer, <clears throat> MVP. And they're just building around that. And with those three players right there, they're going to be nice. Like, they're going to be really, really nice. And I wouldn't find it too crazy. Because remember, Murray also adds toughness. And that was the thing they lacked in the playoffs. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if well, they made it to the championship last year. Or this upcoming year. I wouldn't be surprised. No, I completely agree with you. And, um... Uh... To talk about teams who are making me scratch my head during the uh, first day of this playoffs, it, it has to be the Spurs. Like you were saying earlier, they just gave Doug three years, 42, and now they're giving Zach Collins three years, $22 million. Neither one of them were bad contracts by the value, but y'all know Zach Collins is one of the most injury-prone players in the league. It, I expected more from them. They even, like, drafted weird by getting Josh Primo, like, pretty much in the lottery. Like, I don't – like, what's, what's going on with their front office? Here's what it is, and I may be wrong, right? If you think differently, um, obviously let me know. The Nets are the Nets. The Spurs are drafting as if they still have the greatest power forward of all time. And you can build anything around him, right? The Spurs have always drafted, like, a certain personality type. Uh, the Spurs have always drafted, like, you know, really good, like, really, really good role players. But they could only do that because they have had in their premises a top five center of all time. Um, the greatest power forward of all time. Um, one of the greatest Spanish players of all time. Um, and a really, 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 really one of the greatest French players of all time. But they're not there no more. Like, this ain't 99. This ain't 2009. This ain't 2017. You're gonna have to, like, you lost Kawhi, and I'm still kind of, like, don't understand that whole situation. But you lost Kawhi. You lost a franchise player. You're going to have to find another one of those. You might have to tank a season 
and get one of those, right? Because I have the full confidence that, that they can build around a superstar. We've seen it for like 20, 30 years. That's my bad. They had the Iceman. We've seen it for like 40 years, right? But they have to get a superstar. And for some reason, they're not getting one through free agency. They've never gotten one through free agency. So you got to draft one. And they're not drafting any either. They're just drafting really, really, really good role players. And, and I'm like, is, it's not like they've had particular, like, even when they're bad, it's not like they've been, they've had like top five picks. Yeah, but I need them to take that L. And I'm like, take that big L and like get that draft lottery percentage of getting that number one pick very, very high. Like, they need to like just tank or something because. They got DeMar DeRozan. DeMar DeRozan was like, he proved he couldn't win in Toronto. So, like, it was like, you know, it is what it is. Uh, Aldridge proved that he couldn't really win in um, in uh, uh, Portland, right? I don't mean, like, win. They won that winning season, but I mean, win the championship, right? Um, so, you had really good players, but I, need, but I need them to get one superstar, and I have confidence to build around him. But they just need one and just take one or two seasons off of like being in limbo right now. They've been in limbo. They've been in limbo for a minute. I didn't yeah. take one or two seasons off and go. You know what? Let's lose. I know our fan base is not used to this, but we're gonna we need to do this for the betterment of like the team in the future. Let's just lose, and then boom, you'll get that one player, and you're like okay, because all they need is one player to build around because they will build a number two. They'll build a number three, but they need that number one, and they're not gonna get it being in this weird limbo space that they've been in for the last four or five years. You know what's wild about that? I feel like this is literally the year for that because they have a Spursian type player, like multiple Spursian type players that are coming out in this next draft. So this is the perfect year for them to kind of like take that gamble. And I think they're going to be forced to because LaMarcus Aldridge isn't there anymore. He retired. And they after them letting him walk. And now DeMar, DeMo, DeMar DeRozan is out of there, too. And he's thinking about going to the Bulls. So Is, it, is he really? Yeah. Is, you I know, just thought something was also rumors and whatnot. about the Knicks, too. Yeah. So, yeah, he's, he's not. He won't be in Toronto. I mean, yeah. Toronto. Shoot, he, won't be, he, he won't be in San Antonio. Where it, won't Toronto, it won't be in Toronto either. You're right about that one. Um, I don't know. Ooh. Well, hold on. If he went to the if he went to the Bulls, I don't know. I, he just don't win. Like I don't, like like he he can't be a number one or two. Like he don't win. So I'm like he'd be a great number three, right? But a one or two, I don't know. And like, but if he went to the Bulls, he got a lot of shooting. But the Knicks are so grinding and nose to the pavement you know what i mean so blue collar you know what i mean like they still like i'm like okay like they might knock that anxiety out out of uh demar de rose in the way they they play it what i can't say that what's, what's going on what's going on you wow that's it <laughs> that's, that's serious that's how like hard nose they played last year right um so i'm yeah i'm uh I don't know where he's going to go, but San Antonio need to do something different. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, this this has been like an interesting two hours of free agency, but I think that's all of the big storylines. I don't really want to talk about the role players who have signed that much. Uh, I'm sure they will make contributions in what? their time you there. talk about Trevor Reza going to the Lakers? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not at all. That is that is a nice storyline though. He goes back to possibly win another chip when he already won one with Kobe, and now you do it with LeBron. Great story. Um, I, anything I'm interested in. <laughs> Portis is staying with the Bucks for what little it's actually worth. Yeah. Wait, what were you saying? I said Portis is staying with the Bucks. It's two well, years with the team op- with a player option on the second. Like, very smart. Yeah. Yeah. He. And Tim Hardaway Jr. staying with the Mavericks. Yeah. 
Hey, Bobby Ford is not leaving Milwaukee without a baby. I'm, I'm telling y'all. I'm, t- I'm <laughs> telling y'all. <laughs> that this man was having man. way too much fun. <laughs> so he um, leave without a baby. <laughs> but I think that that pretty much wraps us up for all of the moves that have happened so far in free agency that we're willing to care about. Uh, Wayne Ellington went to the Lakers, you know, cheap shooter. Uh, that's always a nice one-year deal. But I think this is time for Coach Cal to go ahead and do his thing mm-hmm. for the Oh, wait, are we going to get into the draft at all before? Or That's kind of a lot, too, isn't it? It is. It is. And I don't want to make this episode too long. We already pretty much had an hour. So uh, we're going Fair to enough. go ahead and move on. All right. Um, what? Of course... Um, John Shares, who is Coach K's handpicked successor, basically, has done surprisingly well on the recruiting trail so far. Um, just getting, what, Derek Whitehead to commit, and uh, I just... I had Kyle Filipowski. Thank you. So, like, the recruiting will be pretty solid. I, I don't know whether or not the coaching will take a hit, but... Yeah, it, it's big shoes to fill regardless, so. Yeah. Um, Duke is pretty much making me eat my words. I wrote an article not too long ago where I was like, I really don't know what recruiting is going to look like in the future. And I guess you're still getting that little wave of uh, Coach Cap, Coach K. So it's really about uh, seeing how well they continue to do. But uh, I watched the EYBL about like a week or two ago. They just wrapped up. Uh, Philip, back up. You mad close. Uh, but um, both of the dudes that they got are top tier in their class. Derek Whitehead, I personally think, should have took that G League offer. That's how nice he is. We talked about him on an uh, episode of the Prospects Corner where he is head and shoulders probably one of the more athletic guys when we're talking about first step alone. Like, there wasn't a single person that could do could have like a decent closeout on him where during that St. James time. And then Kyle was just 6'11", moves really well, does a bit of everything on the floor, and is elite with that type of skill set. Um, so it's nice to see that they pretty much walk away with uh, two guys that are listed as five stars, knowing that uh, Coach K won't be there. Yeah, like if, I'm, I'm sure Duke fans feel a lot, feel more comfortable about it. I'm not sure how they felt about it before, but definitely more comfortable about it now. I guess moving on just a little bit. Also, Rasheed, it's looking like Rasheed Wallace is going to be on Memphis's coaching staff. And like, I, I, I I'm not going to pretend I, I have no idea why. Like, it sounds fun though. I'm not going to lie to you. Like a coaching staff of Penny Hardaway, Rasheed Wallace, and Larry Brown. Um, like, it'll be interesting if nothing else. Right. And the coaching will be good. Right. Hey, didn't Rasheed Wallace and Larry Brown have uh, beef? Or was that, is that is that something I just made up? I, I don't know. Like, I didn't, I wasn't paying attention to the league back then. So. Well, I hope not. We were children. My <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, it'll be, it, like, it'll be interesting regardless, like yeah. I said, right? Um, but, like, I'm not entirely, I'm still, again, I'm not entirely sure why. Um, but it just, it's just one more reason to pay attention to Memphis, if for no other reason than people's amusement. But, like, again, we got Larry Brown. Hope that hopefully means we'll have an offense next year, which means folks have problems. But yeah. Um, also, okay, uh, Texas and Oklahoma um, will be joining the SEC, presumably when the current, I think, what, Big 12 uh, media contract ends here in like two years, I think. 2025. Okay, yeah, yeah. right. And, like, they've already asked to join, and, like, it's been voted on. Like, it's it happened over the course of, like, the last week-ish. Barely that. Like, it's the kind of thing that's, like, 
it happened fast enough that like everybody had made up their minds already type of thing like it it's all formalities um like it's real quick like what do y'all think about it oh uh, i feel like this has to be a college football move because i do not fully see why either of them would make the move out of the big 12 like for basketball reasons because Oklahoma was what like somewhere in the middle where they finished and um, I don't think the SEC is a better basketball conference but if you want to compete with like the top teams in the SEC you're basically competing against the top teams of the Big 12 so you yeah. didn't exactly make it easier for yourself and as far as recruiting there's some kind of powerhouse-ish recruiting in the SEC. So it's really up to you on how you view all of that. Like, I think Texas is going to be just fine. They recently got Coach Beard, the Texas Tech uh, former coach. And Texas is in, like, when we talk about recruiting places, Texas is in love with what Chris Beard has been doing over the past few years. And when we look at the talent that's coming out of Texas all the way up until probably like, I got good notes on everybody until like 2026. We're talking about at least in this, in the class of 2022, they already got a dude who's listed pretty much like four or five star with Arturio Morris. And then we got guys like Keontae George who are top five and also have Texas in their top eight. Um, and then when we go down into 2023 class, all of those dudes are monsters who we talk about and they all have interest from Texas. And then 2024 is going to be a crazy one. 2025 has some hitters. So they have the potential to move up to that upper echelon of um of players i just have no idea what they're going to look like next season considering like all of their notable uh front court players are gone and they're pretty much leading scorer in matt coleman in like top guard he's going to so i guess i'm gonna have to go back and look at that roster but that's also not a thing that they have to worry about for another four years so it almost seems like a mute point to be talking about it at this point. Um, it's 100% a football move. Um, there is no if, or buts about that. Um, you know, Allen can for a long time. It don't matter how big basketball is right now. Football is football in the South. Football is football in Texas. Uh, it's treated like a professional sport, even when you in eighth grade. Like, it is ridiculous how much of a football seat that is. Um, Oklahoma is a football school. I don't care if they have Blake Griffin. I don't care about Buddy Hill. I don't care about Trey Young. Oklahoma, Sumer, that is football territory. So every move they're going to do is dictated upon what is the football team ready to do, right? It's like going to University of Kansas. Yes, if the University of Kansas left the Big 12, right? It wouldn't matter. If they left the Big 12, it wouldn't matter. It would be for the basketball. It wouldn't be for football. Yes, but a football team, right? But it does everything. It, basketball is the only thing that matters, right? But so it's the exact same thing is for football with the other schools. Every school has essentially their uh, every school has essentially their team, right? There's very few schools that have a good basketball and a good football team. It's one or the other. And if you whatever sport that is for that team dictates what that school does like legitimately in terms of conferences and you know rule mandates and all that kind of stuff too uh so it's 100 a football move uh, um uh in terms of how they're gonna do in terms of basketball kentucky doesn't have the stronghold it had so fine you know what i mean like if kentucky was kentucky of like a decade ago then like i think differently but as of right now like they Oklahoma has that one person every three years, that will, every four years, that will, you know, put them on the map. And uh, Texas, Texas will survive. 
You know what I mean? Texas will be there, right? They don't. They won't be up there. You know. I was listening to somebody. Uh, I listened to a a coach. I can't remember who the coach was. It's some time ago where they were talking about the stronghold that University of Texas has on Texas recruitment, and they're like, it's not what it once was, right? Because you have all the other schools and them in tech that are like, that are you know, that at one point were like the underlings. And we're always thought to be the underlings of like Texas sports. But now people of a certain generation don't think that way anymore. They're like, okay, we're going to Texas Texas A&M over University of Texas. Or okay, we're going to Texas Tech over the University of Texas. Um, but I think that Texas being involved with some of these other schools down there uh, in the South will give them more of a, give them more of a grip, a grasp, right? on uh, a lot of recruitment that comes out of the area. So, I mean, it's, it's an all football move. You know, basketball's just along for the ride, I guess. Yeah, pretty much. Like, I I agree with y'all. It's, it's a football move, which basically means that Texas has decided to go to the SEC to collect its, te- to collect its check and get its butt beat by Bama and Auburn every year or every couple of years. I, I don't know how it'll work exactly, but something like that. Like, they'll be like a middle of the pack SEC team. Like, they're, they're not I, about I, to do I anything. I generally think, though, they don't think but, they will be. But hmm? I generally think they don't think they will be. Like, this isn't a football podcast, but like, their front office people are old. They still think of themselves as like, everybody wants to become a bassooner. Everybody wants to go to Texas. Like, they think of themselves in that way. Although, once again, the people of our generation aren't necessarily all gung-ho about that whole time mindset. Uh, But I wouldn't be be surprised just because of the level of competition in the conference goes up that they also don't raise their game just to play against – just because they know they're going against Alabama – every single season now so just for like school pride purposes and just for like the legacy reasons they're gonna step their game up and that can mean anything especially i I, I don't care about their pride they're still getting blown out but like uh, you you you, you say that watch in in five years i don't think it's gonna be the case if you say so but like even from a basketball standpoint right like they're gonna be a middle-ish of the pack team like basketball will probably be better in a better position than football will be but like Excuse me. i don't see them like being like like we look and like they they're the number one team in the sec just because like what kentucky still exists and like granted they were bad la- like last season right they, they were bad mm-hmm. but they they aren't usually anywhere near that bad. They're usually pretty good. I mean, besides kids, that, look, I mean, the kids Tennessee's also, also a good basketball, also a good basketball team, and so does Auburn. Like legitimately good basketball I mean, kids, team. Legitimately though, kids being able to make the money off their like off their likelihood change the game. Like yeah. the game, like certain schools, and I don't care, whatever. Whatever. Certain schools were able to get certain players because they were able to give certain players certain amounts of money. Yeah. Long thing, period. Like, there is no if, as was about that. That's been the case for 30 yeah. years, 40 years, years yeah. right? It is what it is. That's changed. Like, that one aspect, we might not see in right. the next year or two, but the playing field is going to even out a lot more because of that, of that aspect right there. Exp- you, don't, you don't need the school for exposure. So, you don't need the school for, you know, to make that money. Under the table. I, I mean, like, I kind of, I kind of disagree. Like, it's, I don't think it's going to make things worse, but I don't think it'll necessarily make it better. Like, a dude who's, who go, who becomes an All-American at, like, I don't know, because, like, I, I liked Mike Don when he played South Dakota, what, South Dakota State? Um, like, he's, like, after he does that, he's going to be making checks, and, like, there's not really a point in him going any, going somewhere else, but, like, even the kids who are gonna go ride the bench at Duke are probably gonna be pulling in like million dollar endorsement deals or close to like like they're gonna like they're kids who like they would have made that money anywhere anyway 
I mean, but we've always we've already seen in terms of just like even before this whole thing came out, we saw in terms of the spreading of wealth in terms of talent distributed start starting to crumble in terms of distribution, right? It well it used to be Kentucky, whatever, down. Kentucky do down. Mm-hmm. We're always on the lean out. You add money, money to the equation. Oh, it's gonna be lean out a lot more. That's not, that, that, that's, that's, that's 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 what I think at least. So, but it's not gonna take a year or two. It's gonna take like it's gonna take a little bit of time, but it's gonna happen 100. percent This is not good for like this and these the, using your name for a likelihood wherever there. That is not good for Duke, Kentucky, KU. It's not good for them. Well, like the thing is, I don't think it'll hurt them though. That's kind of my entire point. Besides I, I that, they they point. have like they they also have people who can give you endorsement deals who are like donors and stuff. Like they got people who can bankroll that stuff for them in a way that like fam doesn't necessarily. Right. Yeah, I think you know. I think I, I don't know. I also think that the, the the social commentary of just like these schools are starting to also take a shift. So it's gonna be like it might like it might literally just it might even take take a generation, but it will change hundred hundred percent. Um, just because everybody is not all fixated on the, you know, the, I don't want to call it basketball elitist, but it, or call it sports elitist, but essentially what it is, right? Uh, people aren't going to be as fixated on that, and then, but some kids are more fixed on that, fixated on that, because they also, you know, you talk to other players, you know, you get money, to them to learn it, mm-hmm. but like, when all that's getting taken away, all of a sudden, it's going to be like, uh, you know, it's once again, it's going to take a minute, but it's going to be, I think it's going to be the case where people start understanding that they can go anywhere and be fine, at least, off the like, of their name, uh, because of what they bring to the table. Not you make the school, the school doesn't make you. And that's just the mindset that's going to be more established later on. That's fair. Like, that's kind of always been the case, but that's a whole discussion that I'm not trying to get into right now. Um, in a, and, very much related, but also completely different note. Um, also in November, the NCAA will be holding, how is it phrased again? A, a special constitutional convention um, in November. <laughs> huh? That sounds racist. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, like, it's kind of like, a last leg thing or at least it kind of seems like it because it's just like they spent forever not taking charge of anything like none of the name image and likeness stuff right none of, like all the stuff talking about like the stupidity that is a lot that has been a lot of recruiting rules um and just a continue and like a, and, and of course like and granted and like just like not just the various the various issues that the NCAA has had, like shown like it's not it's either not all that powerful or like it's failure to exercise its power in any meaningful capacity put brings into question like why it should even exist if we're honest, right? Because mm-hmm. it's just like you know you sp- you're supposed to kind of be in charge, but like you don't make any decisions, you keep punting the ball, like and so like at this point if I would, like certainly if they don't try and come up with something like we, we've already talked about how like we just talked about how Oklahoma and Texas are set to move to the SEC right mm-hmm. like you could find a situation where it's just the NCAA would be functionally defunct like even less like even less meaningful power to enforce any kind of rules like so I'm assuming they're trying to figure out how to not be dissolved, theoretically. Like, but I don't know. What, sh- what do y'all think? I don't know nothing about this, to be honest with you. And um, <laughs> any, anything tied to, like, the NCAA, I could care less unless they're given more provisions so players can really have autonomy. Um, I don't know, man. Be it'd be nice to see what they say. Like this, this is a, <laughs> this is a conference in November that I'm like, okay, I guess we can tune in to see what like the notes or like readings that come out of it. But uh, as of today, I don't, I don't know what any of this means. Me neither. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I'm gonna be honest, I also don't know what it means. Uh, give me about three years. I got you though. <laughs> it's basically three years. Uh, guys, I think that is it for our topics today. So yeah. let's go ahead and wrap this bad boy up. Guys, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Traveling Hoopers podcast. I have been your host, Alan Pettigrew, and my two, I, not even guests, my, my analyst, my brothers, Philip Dixon and Calvin. Go ahead and sign us out. Um, once again, of course, I'm Calvin McGowan. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for tuning in to another episode of the Traveling Hooper um as usual you know if you're joining us on youtube you know like share subscribe leave something in the comments of course can always listen to us wherever you listen to your podcasts um and have a good rest of your week all right yep this is philip jackson uh aka netflix boy and um once again uh thanks for listening uh but also if you have a chance uh please um listen or please watch the final season of atypical on netflix very good show along uh, also uh my, on my block is coming up the last season also so continue to watch it as well and support these different shows that are actually good for people and not the bachelorette <laughs> all right so with that in the case see you guys later